So what is AI? Intelligence is the ability to recognize and create patterns relevant to some purpose. Artificial intelligence is about getting machines to do things that we recognize as intelligent when people do them. One hallmark of human intelligence, the ability to use tools to make tools. Animals use tools. I'll show you some photos of that. But they don't use tools to make tools like we do. And it's worthwhile noting the AI community has been frustrated uh, in that when we actually build something that works, people say, well, you know, that's just part of medicine. So if you blow into a respirometer and an AI uh, diagnoses your pulmonary disease, you know, people just say, well, that's just a respirometer today. That's not AI. I mean, after all, you haven't built HAL yet. And that's absolutely true. So what can AI do today? Does anybody want to uh, pick out something that AI can't do today? Come on, I've tried to color code this for your edification. <laughs> There's a pattern here. The, the red things. The, well, yeah, the red things. Score high on a comprehension test of a new Broadway play. Buy a week's worth of groceries at Whole Foods at rush hour. Dan's working on that. Uh, unload any dishwasher and uh, put everything away. These are seemingly simple things for people to do. Computers can do differential calculus with ease, but they can't shop at Whole Foods during rush hour. <clears throat> so AI is also an innovation amplifier. Um, you see that a genetic algorithm can build something like a microwave antenna for NASA, something totally inhuman. Very few human engineers would come up with that particular screwy paperclip design. AIs are also embedded into fighter aircraft. There's a pilot's associate that DARPA sponsored, also known as Bitching Betty, who says, incoming at 12 o'clock, dear, do you want me to take care of it for you? Or uh, deliberate drug design, or Canon is using AI to design lenses in a matter of weeks where it used to take years or labs that are entirely automated. Uh, all of those are enabled by AI as an innovation amplifier. And AI is also embedded in robotics. Robotics is, in fact, AI walking around. And Dan will be talking to you about that later. So we have AI embedded on Mars now. We have AI in RoboCup soccer. We have AI all over high schools in America and throughout the world, in the first competitions that Dean Kamen has encouraged. We have an AI, a personal AI embedded in the personal robot at Willow Garage. And we have AI embedded in the DARPA Grand Challenge machines that drive themselves either from the Mojave Desert to Las Vegas or through an, a simulated urban area. Not yet downtown Palo Alto or New York, or Bombay. AI is also about manipulating information, and it is related, that manipulation of information is directly related to the way that robots manipulate matter. So AI manipulating bits and information, robots manipulating molecules and matter, at any scale, including the nanoscale. So here we see that technology is a combination of components which themselves are combined of, of other components and new technologies become the next generation, tech, uh, next generation components for newer technologies and then driven by competitive evolutionary pressures, the result is accelerating exponential change. Here we have Alan Turing, inventor of the Turing test. I think all of you are familiar with this. Does anyone want to describe it for the group? So it's basically a, where you have a computer and a human or more than one a panel, yeah. but they're disguised to a judge who yeah. then has a conversation with them all and tries to determine which one is human and which one not. Right, and exactly right. And what are the problems with a test that attempts to discriminate 
uh, between a computer and a human being, just typing back and forth. Anybody see any problems with that? Yeah. Right. Uh, it's not the whole range of human behavior. Also, maybe the AI is actually smarter than a human, uh, unlikely today, but uh, a human judge might think that the answers were very strange. Uh, so we're using as a benchmark human intelligence, and that's one benchmark among many. But certainly we would like to pass that benchmark, and it hasn't happened yet. So here we get to James's question about narrow AI and strong AI. Narrow AI is what you see uh, in applications today. The AI performs a very specific task in a specific domain, and when it's outside of that specific task or specific domain, it tends to be very brittle. Strong AI is about exhibiting that broad, deep, subtle intelligence that we associate with human intelligence, but after all, Artificial general intelligence or strong AI may exceed human intelligence in many dimensions. Speed, memory, multitasking, bandwidth, pattern recognition, ability to learn quickly, and the ability to share its knowledge with its contemporaries in near real time. That would be a cool trick. Uh, we would like to be able to do that immediately. So narrow AI is valuable and useful. It's pretty much what people think about when they think about AI applications today. And artificial general intelligence is something that people who read a lot of science fiction think is here today. It's not yet here today. It's an exciting research frontier. And I think we'll get there before 50 years, long before 50 years. But I think we'll continue to have breakthroughs at least through the next 50 years and beyond. So how? Virtually all AI applications are described in terms of representation, inference, and control. Oftentimes the representations that we use are implicit rather than explicit. The relevant domain knowledge has to be represented in a form that the machine can interpret it and then act upon it. And you need to be able to make inferences about the knowledge. If x, then y. And then you have to be able to control the knowledge processing. You have to be able to say, first do this part of the problem, and then do that part of the problem, and then do another part of the problem. So let's look at the current toolkit. We don't have a lot of time to go through this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blast through these slides quickly. And I'm around the whole week or nine days. And we can talk about any of these things in depth. Expert systems are really about capturing, emulating, and distributing expertise that's modeled from humans. In fact, let me just go to some slides that go a little deeper right away. Typically, um, these systems are built by humans, by so-called knowledge engineers. They are coded by hand. People sit down and interview experts and try to understand how they solve their problems and then emulate that in a machine. The systems typically have a set of rules, not always rules. It could be objects that are related to each other in a particular way, and a working memory of facts that is stored in a database. And then the system may ask for additional information in real time during a consultation. These systems formalize knowledge in sometimes thousands of rules, thousands of chunks, and the knowledge systems can provide usually performance that uh, meets the expert's uh, level of performance, sometimes performance that greatly exceeds it. There are many examples of exceeding human levels of performance. <coughs> Mycin, one of the early expert systems built by Ted Shortliff, did exceed, it diagnosed bacteremias, and it did exceed the diagnostic capabilities of some of the people that were using it, that, that were used to build it. Narrow domain knowledge leads to brittle performance. It's one of the real weaknesses of this approach. Uh, if you ask any of these brilliant systems that do diagnosis about a glass of orange juice, they have no clue. They just fall off the cliff directly. Bayesian models are built on the mathematical foundation of Bayes' logic. Tom Bayes sort of 
built through an entire system of dealing with probabilistic logic. We build the probabilistic rules into belief networks. The purpose is to determine the likelihood of future events based on similar occurrences in the past. These systems can be incorporated into knowledge systems. They're often used for a variety of applications that include filtering email or filtering messages that are coming through the BitTorrent of the web. The rules are often coded by humans and then variants can sometimes uh, induce their own rules. And the probabilities may be modified by training or real world data. Hierarchical temporal memory is fairly new. Uh, this is a system that was uh, designed by Dilip George, uh, who came through uh, Stanford to Numenta and worked with Jeff Hawkins on this. The guy, Jeff is the guy who built the Palm Pilot. These systems are in their uh, embryonic formulation. Uh, we've used them uh, directly for pattern recognition tasks. Uh, they're based on insights uh, from a guy named Montcastle on the brain's reward prediction mechanism. Moncastle pointed out that the primary function of memory is to predict reward by recognizing the patterns that lead to reward. So it's not so much if, if I throw Jeff a ball and he catches it by putting his, his arm in the right place and his hand in the right place, he's not calculating the velocities and the accelerations and doing uh, calculus to catch the ball. He's remembering uh, how he got rewarded the last time he <coughs> caught the ball. So it's all about uh, framing the brain as a, a memory system that encodes for reward. So uh, the HTM, or hierarchical temporal memory, nodes are arranged in a hierarchy that discover spatial and temporal patterns uh, over a sequence of time. So you can show it uh, a sequence of frames or a video, uh, and it can recognize patterns. Uh, this system has been codified in software. Numenta has new pick software. You can download it yourself in a kit. You can also download a vision toolkit uh, at the Numenta website. And uh, Jeff and Dilip uh, recently got a paper published, I consider a landmark paper, um, uh, called Towards a Mathematical Theory of Cortical Microcircuits uh, in the Proceedings of Computational Biology. It's a, a conference. You, you can take a look at it. It's, it's really a remarkable piece of work. Um, right now, that software I, I consider extremely promising. That approach is very promising, but again, embryonic. So neural networks uh, simulate a simplified multi-layer model of neurons and interneuronal connections. They don't necessarily follow uh, the brain's way of implementing neurons. That's not the point. Uh, it is a nonlinear statistical data modeling approach to pattern recognition. It's not a biologically driven approach like Numenta's. It's used to model complex relationship between inputs and outputs to find patterns. You change the weights uh, in the nodes in the network of a multi-layer network based on training data sets. The old time classical versions of this didn't handle temporal data well. The new ones are, are doing a little better. You could think of Numenta's system, their hierarchical temporal memory, as a kind of neural network. They wouldn't describe it that way. These systems are amenable to parallel processing algorithms and hardware. That's one of their advantages. They're used in facial and handwriting recognition fraud detection. Genetic algorithms are a problem-solving method that emulates evolutionary selection. They are really powerful for doing specific kinds of things where you have a parametric design problem. Their sweet spot is a parametric design problem where you have uh, parameters that can be manipulated like genes. Uh, in the genetic sequence. So you can define a genetic code list you, of bit strings. These are parameters of the problem. Say you're trying to design a, an airplane, uh, and you have wing shape, and you have uh, how long the batteries can store um, hydrogen. 
uh, and produce electricity, and you have uh, velocities of the plane, and you can define a fitness function. All those parametric um, items have a fitness function. You might need the plane to achieve a certain velocity or be able to stay aloft for a certain period of time. And the systems can score each solution's performance in a simulation. And then uh, you can randomly generate these codes. You vary the parameters. Each of the parameters, each of these sort of solution bit codes represents a candidate solution or, or an organism. And the highest scoring solutions uh, live, the lowest scoring ones are eliminated, and then you can reproduce and, and uh, recombine these parameters in the population. You can have two of the candidate solutions exchange their parametric genes, and you can see which ones do the best on a fitness function. So you keep doing this iteratively, time and again, varying the parameters, exchanging <laughs> genes with the candidate solutions. And you can end up, after many iterations, with a solution that is inhumanly wonderful, like that uh, antenna that we saw, that microwave antenna. On the other hand, it's very difficult to examine these solutions and find out how we got there exactly. Uh, so they're a little bit inscrutable, and that turns out to be problematic. Um, but it's worth knowing that this solution uh, set is available, this technique is available, if you have a parametric design problem. So let's talk about reverse engineering the brain and AGI. Let's look at rat versus human brain. Here's the proportion by volume. Well, it is a relief that we have a little bit more cerebral cortex than a, <coughs> than a rat. I'm not so sure how relevant it is in terms of proportion by volume. Nor do I think it's particularly relevant that we're sort of in the middle here of this list of cortical surface area. That may be surprising to some of you. We're, uh, we're not exactly at the top of the animal kingdom on, on this score. So I think that what this points out is that it's not just about the surface area of the cortex. We can see that animals uh, like chimps or dolphins do use simple tools but they don't exhibit the kind of broad, deep, subtle, general purpose intelligence that humans do. So here's a chimp that actually snapped off a branch and stripped it of its leaves and then used it as a tool to uh, extract ants from an ant pile. Uh, clearly planning and clearly had some notion of making a tool that it could use uh, but it's not going much further than that. And the dolphin uh, used sponges to protect them from stinging jellyfish when they go foraging on the reef. Pretty interesting. So one of the things that, uh, that we want to be able to do is see if we can just understand the way that the brain achieves what it does in terms of problem solving. And Looking at the brain in various ways, typically crude ways, are one way to go about trying to understand what's going on. I think we're very much at the early stages of this, but we are going faster and faster. As Ray was saying last night, we're on uh, double exponential curves in some of these for spatial and temporal resolution. Here's uh, com computerized tomography or CAT scanning. That uses x-rays around this a circular device here, and um, it's, it's a very crude technique for really uh, imaging the brain. It's good for uh, finding out if you've got tumors, but not great for looking at sort of the detailed structures. Um, electroencephalograms and are a little bit better, uh, but they are subject to all kinds of artifacts and noise associated with picking up weak electrical signals on the scalp. Although this is one of the areas where being bald is a huge advantage, a huge competitive advantage. Imaging with superconducting <coughs> quantum interference devices is uh, now uh, coming into its own. These, uh, this helmet that looks like a hair dryer uh, has a liquid helium cooled to about four degrees centigrade. Uh, and 
Uh, there are about 150 something magnets in the uh, helmet and they're picking up magnetic signals. And the nice thing about that is the magnetic signals are less subject to artifacts than the weak electrical signals that are used in EEG. Uh, but we're still not getting uh, the kind of resolution that we need from EEG. fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging, is a little deeper. Um, this system uses a very powerful magnet, electromagnet. Uh, I, I once saw a picture of, a, uh, of a, a whole platform that was several feet away from this electromagnet, got sucked into the uh, the donut hole of the uh, fMRI because it has such a strong magnetic field. That magnetic field is used to align um, protons in regular fMRI and then a brief radio pulse is given and then you see a signature of the tissues and you can make inferences with the signature of the tissues and, and how those protons are aligned, uh, typically from uh, hydrogen in the water in the brain. But in this case, we're looking at blood flow in the brain, and it's actually a, 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 a proxy for what parts of the brain are doing what kinds of work. So you can look at what parts of the brain are being oxygenated. The system is sensitive to um, oxygenated hemoglobin, and you can image the brain and get kind of interesting results here. Again, it's a proxy for something that we're really interested in. Um, this was a simulated driving task, and you can see that there are um, different uh, cuts through the brain. Uh, by the time you are uh, here, sort of in the middle, uh, you're sort of halfway through the brain, and then you go all the way down. You can see the two lobes of the cerebellum uh, towards the bottom. And then there are higher order visual tasks, lower order tasks, motor control tasks, vigilance, error monitoring visual monitoring, and you can see that different parts of the brain light up for different tasks. And that's, you know, it's interesting, it's useful, it, it's starting, to, the question is, what, what do you do with this data? I mean, how do you turn this data into an understanding of how we actually work? And the answer is that uh, you keep at it, you keep modeling uh, everything that you know about how the brain works. And in this case, um, a guy named uh, Edelman uh, also worked with the, the author here. He was, he was part of the et al., Gerald Ed Edelman. And they are using data from MRI uh, to look at the relationship between the thalamus and the upper sensory parts of the brain, so you've got the thalamus that is down here, and you're looking at tracks as it goes into uh, various parts of the brain, and they're trying to just understand uh, how these tracks are related. This, this is a, a model of white matter in the brain, and it is giving uh, them a color-coded view of what the connections are. Here's a deeper projectome modeling. This is work that was done by Darmenda Moda and his colleagues at IBM. And uh, they also used an FM, fMRI and other data. And what they're doing is, is modeling the projections of certain tracts of um, the cortical circuits and how they relate to sort of the deeper thalamic circuits. And this is probably uh, one of the deepest views of the brain. And again, it doesn't tell them how people are solving problems in calculus. What it does tell them is what the circuitry looks like. And in fact, Lloyd Watts has reverse engineered the circuit for the auditory pathway. And this circuit really does emulate the performance of the human auditory system. You can give it the same inputs and outputs and see that it does a very good job of emulating the, the human auditory system. And in fact, there are a number of artifacts that have come out of this. Uh, one is an improvement in hearing aids. And another one is a, a company called Audience, which is building chips uh, into cell phones that will reduce the, uh, this, the noise level 
uh, so that when people are listening to people in a crowded room, they're sort of selecting out uh, the human speech patterns. Here is a simulation of cerebellum, and you can see, in fact, that the real world data looks like this, and the trained data from this model of the cerebellum looks very, very similar. So we're starting to get, we're starting to use these um, images to build models that are deeper and deeper until we can finally sort of build the circuit diagram of the cerebellum and the auditory system and the visual system, et cetera. So it's sort of uh, uh, going through one piece at a time and seeing what we can do to reverse in engineer the brain. The, again, the purpose is not to just build a brain. The purpose is to understand the principles by, by which the brain works. Uh, Numenta is sort of uh, getting an inkling of that. And then being able to implement those principles in a new and different way. An example would be the Wright brothers may have studied birds flying, but they didn't build uh, at, in their design that worked, they didn't build a flapping airplane. Uh, they built something very different, and jet engines are very different. So I suspect when we get around to building strong AI, it won't look anything like the brain, but it will use some of the brain's principles. Uh, ben Goertzel at Novamente uh, has been uh, going after artificial general intelligence for quite a while. We've been on several conferences uh, on biologically inspired computing architectures, and there's a whole community now at DARPA that is interested in biologically inspired computing, and, uh, and it's really become uh, a whole area unto itself, and, and part of the community, a niche in that community, is uh, using analytical approaches to uh, understanding what the brain is doing and modeling it. And uh, the Novamente approach here picks out pieces of the brain like goal and feeling refinement, doing inference there, intensive pattern mining, uh, using uh, inferential reasoning and evolution, schema learning, large-scale pattern mining, using greedy da data mining. These are just techniques. So the, the idea here is that Ben is looking at the different subsystems of the brain and inferring what components he has to build in software in order to emulate the brain's problem-solving behavior. This has been going on for quite a while. I, I think that it's, uh, it's one approach among many. I think it's interesting, but um, not necessarily something that's going to yield immediate results. We have a uh, on-the-ground uh, existence proof of a general purpose problem solver in the brain, and I think it's likely that reverse engineering the brain, understanding its principles, uh, building circuits that emulate what the brain does and then moving forward from there is probably going to get us there faster. But who knows? Questions about that, about those approaches and their competitive advantages? Yes? Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, so you, you asked the question, what's an even more powerful test of predicting intelligence than, yeah. the, than the Turing test? Yeah. And uh, Kurtz, Kurtz Wall yesterday, he had mentioned that the intelligence is the ability to predict the future, where um, you know it could be defined as our ability to predict what if scenarios really rapidly. Yeah. Um, and you know, so, for one example, might be humans predict that if we build a car, uh, our prediction is that car will move us around, and we sure enough we build it and it does. Right. And uh, and I just wonder, prediction tasks could range from the simple like predicting what, will the sun arise, ri what time will the sun rise tomorrow, right. or the very complex, which is beyond human capacity, presumably today, like predict if this design of a robot will put away all the, all the dishes. Yes. And I just wonder if anyone has talked about, or what are people's thoughts, or could the ability to predict be a more scalable test for, than Turing for you know, scaling, the, scaling right. intelligence or giving yeah, the Yeah, it's a great metric. question. Uh, I really like that question. I, I think that Let's take it in stages. So about classes of prediction. Um, it's true that uh, prediction is uh, one of the hallmarks of intelligence, but predicting that some specific event will happen on November 14th, 2012 is probably not the kind of prediction that, that we're talking about here. That's for fortune tellers for the most part. 
There, there's, a, there's an interesting article on effective forecasting by Paul Sappho, who's one of the faculty here, that's in Harvard Business Review, that talks about different classes of, he's a futurist, he was sort of headed up uh, the Institute for the Future for quite a while, maybe 25 years, and he was talking about uh, different classes of prediction and the, and the cone of uncertainty uh, as, as you move into the future. Uh, so the kind of prediction that, that he was saying humans are good at is trend analysis along some boundary conditions. So one of the hallmarks is being able to say, well, these are the trends. You, you know, it's unlikely that you'll say, that you'll hear somebody say, well, on this specific date, X will happen. So you want pattern recognition of trends. You want people to have real confidence in um, if I do X, if I build a system of a certain class, uh, a system that can go um, escape the Earth's gravity, uh, like Dan will be talking to you about later, um, and you know, maybe we can get to the moon and back, or maybe we can get to Mars or and back, maybe we can go further. Those kinds of predictions we can have a lot of confidence in if we build certain kinds of systems. But it's not fortune-telling prediction. So the, the, uh, the Loebner Prize and other prizes that have sort of next generation Turing uh, class um, prizes are usually about uh, seeing if we can emulate some aspects of human prediction. And clearly, uh, you could imagine a whole class of prediction that humans don't do. Let me give you a, a, an example of that. If you unwrap our neocortex, it's about the size of a dinner napkin, right? And six layers, about that big. And one could imagine when we finally learn how to build uh, a neocortical circuit that we could build one the size of a tablecloth, and then maybe the size of a house, and maybe the size of a city block, or ten city blocks, or a city, you know, or a planet. You know, you could really build these things huge. Uh, and so that's actually not unthinkable. In fact, we're thinking about that right now. So imagine what kinds of patterns those systems might be able to detect, things that we've never dreamt of. And actually, the back of Jeff Hawkins' book on intelligence has a, a very brief uh, analysis, just a little inkling of what some of these systems might do. Yeah, great question. Yeah, Gerald. So I've got a question about um, purpose and yep. rewards. So yep. rewards implies that there's some pleasure or something positive that happens to the entity that gets the reward, yes. which goes to kind of motivation and purpose. And right. what is the kind of thinking around um, you know, uh, artificial intelligence or systems? How, how do you give them a reward? Uh, and how do they distinguish that from you know, just existing in whatever you know, right. hardware or substrate they happen to be right. running in? Yeah, so uh, systems that do backchaining, even expert systems that do backchaining, are often called goal-directed, you know, backward inference engines. Uh, so they, they reason backwards from a specific goal, like uh, the goal might be diagnose the disease. What do I need to know before I issue a diagnosis? Well, I need to know all the symptoms, I need to know whether they correlate with a particular kind of disease. So it backchains from the goal uh, to an answer. So that goal is a kind of purpose for those systems. In, in nature, I, there, you know, people refer to two kind of purposes. I'm, I'm not talking about the purpose, like what's the purpose of the organism. It's strictly from the point of view of reward. Uh, these systems are already selected for having purposes. You know, uh, get food, get laid, you know, it's, it's very clear. You know, they are, they are crystal clear on what their purposes are. And the rewards are, are built in. They are endorphins and enkeplins that squirt, you know, basically an, an opiate derivative substance right into the brain, into the pleasure center. What's the equivalent for an AI? The equivalent for, for an AI is, is hitting the fitness function, uh, doing the backward directed reasoning. All those things are simulated but goals. But well, I, you know, the, the notion of whether it gets happy or not, you know, sort of has all kinds of loading on it. Um, from, from my point of view, what matters is the purposeful behavior that we're looking for. And I've seen software systems exhibit 
purposeful behavior uh, around the goals that we give them. And whether they're happy about it or not is, you know, from my point of view, second order. Now, maybe later we'll care about that. But right now, we're just trying to build systems that can walk through doors at, at uh, Willow Garage and that kind of thing. And I think for that, their goal should be, you know, get through the door. Yeah, other questions or else we'll go on? Okay, good questions. Great questions, really fun. So, applications. We've been at this a long time. Long ago, we replaced human labor with animal muscle. And then we, we replaced animal labor with machines. And then, machines largely replaced humans as calculators. We're playing the line drawing game. Have you noticed? Um, in fact, people used to be called calculators. During World War II, they had lines, sort of big rooms filled with people, unfortunately, typically women. Um, you know, I think that it should have been a mix. Uh, but uh, a lot of people, extraordinarily smart, cranking out calculations, uh, and they got automated. Here's Lester Thoreau, an economist at MIT, saying, if you want to see people working hard, go to any underdeveloped country, and you'll see people working like no one in America works, and that economic progress is the replacement of physical exertion with brain power. Indeed. Really important thing here. So AI has been at this um, replacement function for quite a while, um, starting with Dendril. Here's the Dendril team, Bruce Buchanan, Georgia Sutherland, Ed Feigenbaum, Joshua Lederberg, Bill White. Uh, this is a system that assisted organic chemists in determining the structure of organic compounds from mass spec data. And they built heuristic versions of this, um, and they used the mass spec data together with no a knowledge base of chemistry that was built on this uh, Nobel Prize winner's knowledge, Joshua Lederberg. Uh, and this system generated hypotheses about the structure of the chemicals in the mass spec uh, data, and that was fed back into the system uh, to test applicability. These systems were hand-coded in LISP at the time. So the AI application story goes like this. You know, where we were, some examples of that. Where we're now, some examples of that. What worked? what didn't work, what the rules are for building narrow AI systems, and then what's next when we get beyond narrow AI systems. So we talked about the, the frustration in the AI community that if we build things that work, people say it isn't AI, or people outside the community say AI is all hype, or uh, they say AI was tried and it failed. And in fact, a lot of the early expert system companies are no longer with us. And companies are going to come and go just as the technologies come and go. That's, that's OK. Um, and we are now at um, a little bit uh, past the 400 mark. We're at 438 of successful, documented AI applications. Uh, you can go to this website at the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. Uh, we've been running an innovative application of AI conference for over 20 years. Um, we are, uh, we pull out, um, I've been on the uh, technical program review committee for over a decade, and we've, we get hundreds of applications that are documented, that uh, talk about what the benefits are, that talk about what the techniques are, uh, and we select 20 each year, and we're now past 400. Uh, these are deployed and emerging applications. The emerging applications don't have to actually be in the field, but many of these are fielded. Uh, there's a whole community of practice, um, and the range of AI applications is really enormous. It's globally distributed. They are ubiquitous, built into lab equipment in hospitals, built into air traffic control, built into car traffic control, uh, built into uh, the fabric of everyday lives, even some cell phones. So um, they're distributed across a wide range of domains, 
and a wide range of tasks. Let me be very crystal clear with you about that distinction. So when we talk about task-specific, we're talking about systems that can do something like diagnosis or design or planning. But let's take diagnosis for an, an, an example. Let's say we build a skeletal system that is world-class at diagnosis. Great. So it's world-class at what kind of diagnosis? Let's say it's um, renal pathology. Well, if you give it a cardiac problem, it falls off the cliff. So maybe we build a system that does diagnosis for the whole human machine. That would be a great thing. And in fact, there are systems uh, that are attempts to do this. And they are good for a certain value of good at doing diagnosis uh, for humans and their pathologies. But if you give it uh, the task of diagnosis for your lawnmower, it knows nothing about that. So the lawnmower domain is distinct from the renal or the cardiac domain. So the domain refers to the, the subject area, and the task refers to what kind of problem solving are you doing. So these systems are delivered in lots of different formats, PCs, PDAs, cloud web services. So I made a list of the application domains. I gave a, a, a talk at the AI conference on, uh, I think, 362 at that time, uh, applications that had been done, and tried to look at across that list about what people were working on and what kind of domains and tasks. So you can see that it goes all the way from computers and software engineering, manufacturing, military finance, et cetera, through space, transportation, airlines, sales, and continues on to things that you wouldn't ordinarily associate with uh, expert system application domains like paleontology and treaty verification. There are actual papers written on this with systems that are deployed for these subjects. I, I can show you uh, a few of these. And here's some tasks. Here's a list of tasks. These are not just toy projects. These are projects that really have benefit, that are well documented. You can go to the IAAI conference site and read the papers. I encourage you to do that. So you can see a wide variety of tasks. And here are sample uh, of AI application sponsors. You can see there are Fortune 100 companies. Also, every government in the world is involved in some kind of AI application. I should have put Intuit on, on the list as well. Um, so AI is not just deployed worldwide, it's deployed worldwide in depth, multiple places in just about every country. So I think that we're reaching a tipping point. One of the things that we're doing at Singularity University is trying to grapple with this idea of like when will certain things happen, the, the prediction question, and also um, uh, when do we get to the point where something is not just a bleeding edge technology, it's actually ready for prime time. And certainly artificial intelligence, art artificial intelligence as a narrow endeavor um, is ready for prime time and has been for quite a while. Uh, general artificial intelligence is not ready for prime time yet but it will be one day. So what were the sources of value added? I tried to characterize across a lot of different papers, uh, what was it that was giving the lift to these applications? Where, where were people really getting traction? So augmenting skills, improving accuracy and consistency, improving quality, productivity, decreasing costs. These were non-trivial benefits from implementing systems of this kind. Here's an example uh, from the military. This was a system that DARPA sponsored, a BBN built for the Navy for Syntac Fleet. Uh, it was an embedded battle management system. There are newer versions of this uh, available, but this one was documented well. Uh, it did force deployment and resource uh, trade-offs. It looked at different COAs or courses of action. Uh, and it had a huge search space, a 10 million element search space, truly inhuman. 
So if you were the Radar O'Reilly person that was that, you know, whose task it was to s solve this problem, you'd be at it for quite a while. You'd be up late into the night. So the productivity improvements went from days to hours and hours to minutes or less in solving this task. So that's a speed up ranging from 11 to 400, depending on what task it is. Accuracy improved from 90% to 99%. And it was built with a relatively old, this is an older system, it was built with a, an expert system building tool called KnowledgeCraft on, on a special purpose AI <coughs> system. And I'm mentioning this because we'll see as, as we move through the applications that this landscape changes. The contours of the landscape with regard to hardware and software change a lot, and it really matters. <coughs> Here's an example from paleontology. So a system called VIDES, Visual Identification Expert System. It did microfossil identification. It turns out that this was built for British Petroleum, and it turns out that microfossils are associated with certain kinds of strata that have oil. And uh, the identification of these microfossils is absolutely critical for their ability to drill. And it turns out that if they can't get the identification right, it's quite a complex task, if they can't get the identification right, it costs them about a million dollars a day, and a delay could be a week or two. So a typical delay might be 15 million. So this system incorporated all the relevant knowledge of the domain, and uh, it really basically solved the problem for them. They don't have those kinds of delays anymore. Um, it was built on a Sun workstation. Now, now we're going to general purpose workstations instead of special purpose AI workstations. Uh, and it was built using a combination of a roll your own or build your own tools, uh, general purpose AI language like Lisp, and it also used Key, which was a shell for building these kinds of systems. Here's a manufacturing system that was built uh, for the Canadian pulp and paper industry. It's used in 36 mills uh, today, probably more, uh, but at the time that they documented it, it was 36 mills. Uh, and it was a process control advisor that was aimed at something very specific. Um, it was aimed at the resins and lignans that are a byproduct of the paper pulp process. And it tends to gum up the works. So this system had not just the narrow knowledge from a diagnostician that used to be the person who was called in to, uh, to get this system working again and to get the lignans out, but it also incorporated, in addition to that problem-solving diagnostic model, it incorporated a model of the mill itself. So a physical model of the mill, a, a model of how the, the mill, sort of the schematic of how the mill actually works. So you now have a hybrid system that is a model-based system and a problem-solving system, a narrow AI system. And that's a, another trend that we see over time. Any questions about this, why that's a big advantage? So in terms of where we were, a lot of work was done on standalone LISP systems, very special purpose hardware. It was built from the ground up, or it used complex knowledge and engineering tools. They were AI-centric applications, and by that I mean they were applications where the AI was it. Uh, everything revolved from the point of view of the, of the, uh, the company that was kerplunking this thing in place. Everything revolved around this problem-solving system, instead of being deeply integrated into the day-to-day -day operations of these companies. That's something you see in early-stage technology. It's a maturation problem. So these were not integrated with mainstream applications. They were narrow and brittle, hard to maintain, delivered from the outside, and they typically were delivered into weak knowledge management cultures. For those of you, like me, who are interested in technology and are really tech geeks. This notion that it matters what kind of knowledge management culture you drop your system into is perhaps foreign. But it turns out that it is the critical success factor. It usually isn't 
technology. It's a uh, common um, observation in projects of this type that the technology is about 15% of the success factor and the, and the rest um, has to do with the knowledge management culture that you're delivering these systems into. Here's a system called DART, a dynamic analysis and replanning tool. Uh, it was not in, uh, in the uh, IAAI conference. It was built for DARPA by BBN and a few other companies. It was used in the 90s during the Persian Gulf War. It looked at the logistics of transfers uh, from Europe to Saudi Arabia. Um, I, <laughs> I um, was asked at one point to come in and interview the guy who built it because the people who bought it weren't sure what was under the cover. And uh, at the, I guess, Army War College or something, we did a knowledge engineering session in, in front of a bunch of people where we just kept asking questions about what's under the cover. And it turns out uh, what was under the cover was an AI planner, pretty powerful AI planner, a forms system, Oracle Forms, a standard linear programming package that did linear programming optimization. And these were all connected in a really beautiful and cunning way uh, and produced a result that at that time, the, uh, the head of DARPA, I believe, was Vic Reese, uh, and DARPA, the uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the chief sponsor of AI over the last 30, 40 years. And uh, he said that the DART scheduling application paid back all of DARPA's 30 years of investment in AI. It's an interesting comment. Um, here's an example of a plastic formulation tool. Um, this was a 10th anniversary of a system that was first delivered in 94 uh, and revisited and updated. And the reason for mentioning this is GE is a culture that actually gets knowledge management. To stick with a system and continue to improve it for that kind of time is a big deal. This was a case-based system that matched color plastics to customer requirements. They had a web-based tool that saved a fair amount of time for uh, their systems. They deployed it globally. Um, they saved millions in productivity and materials. And it was basically an example of an effective incremental innovation as opposed to a radical innovation. And we can talk about radical innovations. So where are we today? AI plus other technologies, multiple AI components built into hybrid systems, the use of mainstream languages like Java and C++ and Python, use of web standards like RDF or Resource Description Framework and OWL. Uh, these are um, ontologies that are sort of um, enablers for building systems uh, to web standards. Um, integration with mainstream applications like linear programming or Oracle Forms. Um, browsers as the standard GUI instead of special purpose systems. So if you're thinking about in your companies or at, in your home, if you're thinking about building these kinds of systems, think about building them so that they, they really integrate with the culture that you're in. That's how you get them to get past the blood-brain barrier of your organization. Really critical point. And make sure that the applications are user-centric. Yes, go ahead. Are there any knowledge cultures uh, you really wish you could get into, but they're not advanced enough, that, that are bottlenecks to the, the progress of AI? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I sighed because I, I, it's easier to think of exceptions where there are good knowledge management cultures as opposed to the other way around. Um, so you could pick almost any X and get it right in this case. Uh, if you want some explicit examples, let me, let me try to uh, answer that question with uh, something that you might be able to use to identify the hallmarks of uh, cultures that are dysfunctional with respect to knowledge management. You might start with a culture that uh, values um, movie stars, sports stars, and rock stars more than Nobel Prize winners. Uh, you might start with a culture that uh, values uh, raw wealth 
over education and contribution. You might, uh, do you get the picture? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> uh, most of our cultures are, are not good knowledge management cultures. It's the rare exception. Let, let me give you an, an example of an exceptional uh, good knowledge management culture. Toyota is one. Uh, unlike Ford, GM, Chrysler, Toyota has a culture of continuous improvement. And by their own reckoning, they made junk when they first went to market. Uh, I mean, they just <laughs> made terrible cars. And, uh, and they, over a 40, 50 year period, they incrementally improved those cars through, there's a book called A Million Suggestions, uh, by one suggestion after another, after another, after another. They really valued continuous improvement. I, so uh, I work with the Forestry Institute, as you talked about in Canada. Yeah. And I understand absolutely the uh, low knowledge management quotient that yeah. exists there. Yeah. <coughs> and, and so see how important and advanced there is to the use of, of AI in that context. I also work with a machine learning group in Edmonton. Great. They complain vigorously about the lack of data. Yes. So they see a lot of problems but can't get clean data, which yeah. I would imagine is a consequence of a low m knowledge management culture. And then finally, we have these enormous cultural problems that, and social problems we're trying to solve for which people hope uh, AI might be a solution. But again, we don't have we have these bottlenecks within our knowledge systems that, that prevent us from being able to apply these tools. I was wondering if we have a priority list of the low cultures that we want to go after and try and improve to get these successes we're hoping. Yeah, I I would say you could you could pretty much figure that with the exception of the ones that do it particularly well, uh, they're all on, on the list. And the, and the real to sort of honor the spirit of the question. The, the priorities really have to be uh, the education of the people that are doing this work. They have to value knowledge. They have to understand the critical importance of knowledge in problem solving and treat knowledge like it's gold. You know, because if you can capture the knowledge of an expert who's been working on, you know, in the pulp in, in industry and the person is about to retire, and this person knows everything about how these systems work. Uh, to let that person retire or die and not capture the knowledge is really a crime. Uh, and we do that all the time with doctors and you know, all kinds of people who have really specialized knowledge and we let them retire and die and we don't really capture their knowledge. It's, it is a, uh, a cultural tragedy. It's, it's a train wreck. Yeah. On the other hand, just to not uh, end on that note, on the other hand, I think that we're, we're starting to build a culture that does value knowledge. We're starting to understand the importance of knowledge and starting to understand that um, knowledge can live outside of human skulls. And that, in some respects, is the critical insight from expert systems. It's not building these brittle systems one by one. It's understanding that you can harvest the knowledge of a human being and codify it in a, in a software program and distribute it, you know, run the inferences on a computer and distribute those inferences all over the world on the web. Think about that. That is really revolutionary. Good questions. Yeah. Um, where do you see the contributions of countries like China and India? I mean, you just mentioned, you know, knowledge management. I would yeah. argue that they probably have a a little bit more appreciation of, of, of knowledge and wisdom than some of the Western cultures. Yes. Um, they have large numbers of people. Um, they're focusing on education. They, they have large amounts of money as well, but not right. in the past. Yep. How do you see the relationship between the importance of research done in mostly US funded by DARPA versus China and India? Great question. So um, I've been to both and been to the knowledge cultures in both China and, and India. Um, Let's take IIT, for example, the India Institute of Technology. A fabulous institution. You know, it's more competitive by far than MIT or Stanford. I mean, uh, 
It is a rarefied culture and one that really does understand the importance of knowledge and understands the importance of building the knowledge community in villages throughout India. They're not just about themselves. I think one of the things that's different about them it, it, is that they have a culture of focusing on bringing up their country, that is, you know, raising it from its current level. That's not always the focus of uh, institutions in the U.S. Um, and it's becoming, I think, more so. There's a lot more attention to social entrepreneurship at Stanford and MIT and other places. There's a serious culture building around that. But in India, they're in it. You know, they're really right up against it. And they see the importance of building a deeper knowledge culture. Uh, let me uh, talk about China. I think that's a, a different case. So China came out of a sort of a communist, more militaristic uh, past. And in some respects, that, that have, has served them well. Because they have a culture now that uh, really values engineering, really value, you know, they pump out m way more in, in engineers that we, than we do, not just on a population basis, but on a percentage basis. They value engineers. If you tell someone that you're an engineer in China, you are a somebody. You tell someone uh, that you're an engineer in the U.S., you know, you, they ask you, where, you know, wh where's your train? <laughs> you know, they, they don't get it at all. Um, so uh, China really has a deep engineering culture, and they're starting to build a deep science culture. But uh, their engineering culture is, you know, I would say world class and perhaps the best. But yeah. do you see them uh, being a force to be reckoned with in the AI field anytime soon? I do, but that might be counterintuitive to some of my colleagues. Um, they, they don't publish nearly as much in AI. You know, they don't show up at the conferences the same way that uh, U.S. and European researchers do. Um, and it would be easy to dismiss them uh, because of that. But I do think that, uh, that this is a little bit like running a horse race where uh, you have one horse, like the U.S., way in front, but it's traveling at 25 miles an hour. And then you have other horses way back, but they're going 10 times as fast. And so, and then, fast. well, we, we, we'll see. But I, I think we, they certainly have way more than 10 times as many people thinking about certain problems. So, you know, you can, you can figure out uh, what you want to use as your coefficient. But I think that their rate of acceleration is much higher than in the U.S., and that's really the point. It's not, is it 10, is it 5? It, it really is about, um, are they a threat? And I would say any culture that takes knowledge way more seriously than, than we do and really goes after it and, um, and generates more engineers and more scientists and uh, trains them rigorously, that's a culture to be reckoned with. Let me just tell you one quick story to, to cap that. Um, many years ago, I wanted to visit a nanotech researcher in Japan who was several train stops out of Tokyo where the English language signs go away. I was traveling alone with a lot of equipment and um, on vacation, and I was thinking, what am I doing here? You know, it's like really hot and and uh, hard to navigate around without English language signs. And I had read the, uh, the papers of Fujimasa and his graduate students, and uh, I thought they were doing fabulous work and wanted to meet them. And um, I, I got within about, they were at a, a cam an overgrown campus, old campus of the University of Tokyo. And uh, I got within about 25 feet of uh, Fujimasa's lab, and suddenly a window flings open, and it's Fujimasa, and he says, Jacob Steinson, catch! And he throws me a beer. <laughs> so I catch this beer, I'm you know, I catch this beer, sort of, what? And, and he says, take off shoes, come inside. So I take off my shoes, and I come inside, and I expected to see all these 
graduate students, you know, dutifully with their, you know, noses and their keyboards and on, on their uh, scanning electron microscopes. And nope, it was a Friday afternoon, and they were sitting around, uh, standing around, drinking beer and betting on sumo wrestling. And they were doing world-class research. And I saw that, and I thought, oh, we are in trouble now because these guys were loose like Silicon Valley folks on a Friday afternoon. I mean, it's not always beer, but it's, you know, it's that kind of culture of being loose and kidding around and not being hierarchical and you know, really sort of uh, being relaxed and exchanging ideas. It was really quite extraordinary. Um, I got back from that trip and wrote a, a letter to the president's science advisor at, at that time, and I got a form letter back saying, you know, uh, don't worry about anything. We're, we're the leaders in nanotechnology. Okay. <laughs> I, I think we are today. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs>